This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You're lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. Season 3, Episode 12. Thank you, Todd, but I really could have found my way here on my own. I know what you said, Sir Baba, about your head being all connected to the rooms again and such like. Uh, uh, Miss Alma was adamant I at least walk you over, so here I am. <laughs> uh, make sure nothing slithers out of door and gobbles you up, eh? I take it back, Dad. He's even weirder than Uncle Jim. I appreciate it. Do you want to stay and help me look around? I do. I do. Maybe, maybe next time. Yeah. Uh, between the warden and the mizzle, I've got a chore list as long as, uh, well, <laughs> it's long, so, <laughs> yeah, so I've got to get after it. I understand. Next time, then, I'll hold you to that. We can have a drink afterwards. The lavender dining room, perhaps. We haven't been there in months. Sounds lovely. I'll be by again in a bit to escort you to your door. Yes. Right away, sir. I'll call when I know more. I can't imagine he's pleased. That, my dear, would be a dramatic understatement. Are you sure the Admiral's connection has returned, Bob? I saw it with my own eyes, ma'am. He never strayed from the path. Hmm. Where is the subject now? Todd just dropped him off in the North Hall. He's continuing one of his little investigations. I'd just like to say again how hollow I think that pretense is. The Admiral has been looking for that snake for years now. It keeps him busy and focused. What can it hurt? The Admiral is no fool. The very fact that he is allowed to go wandering unattended 
no doubt tells him what we think of his efforts. He most likely will learn nothing, yes. And if he does learn anything, the architect will see it, be able to review it, and we will know it as well. He is intelligent, driven. With respect to you both, I think you underestimate what he's capable of. All right. You practiced this a hundred times, Dad, just like I showed you. My hands up like this. Good. Now hold the knife just so. Blood is the purest way to do magic. Even a little can do wonders. Just a shallow cut on my palm. And... Aldulia. Aldush. Balaka. I think... Dad! You did it! For as long as it lasts, they won't be able to see what you're doing. <sighs> did... Look. The cut. It's already healed. <laughs> it's taken months, but we'll make a warlock out of you yet. Well done. I wish I understood how you know how to do this, son. I do too. It's... frightening, sometimes. What I know. Things I wish I didn't know. Yes. Well, you're my secret weapon. With you at my side, I know. I know I'll get out of here. Come on. Let's get to work. Alma, what have the texts said? Do you have any notion as to what might have caused this? Every thesis I could get my hands on agrees. By removing the runes here in operations, he should be disconnected from the runes. Then, how? And after all this time, something must have changed. But what? Bob, have you spoken to the Warden? We'll need to book the Admiral for another session in the barn. We need answers, and we need them soon. Since the incident in the driveway, it's been difficult to locate him. That appears to be how he wants it, for now. Even if the Warden was available, I don't think it's wise to attempt another repeat of the barn incident. All we really learned was just how resilient the Admiral is to pain. Beckett reported to me as soon as he was sure the connection was real. He didn't have to do that. He could have hidden it from us. If we want answers, I think we need to look elsewhere. What? What is it? Alma. Would you give us the room, please? Of course. Anything? No, Bob is smarter than I thought. It wasn't this wing after all. How did he know to cover his tracks? He's clever. He must be to have survived this long. Clever, but weak. I get the feeling something happened to him. That woman, 
Samantha. Something about the way they talk about her. Hmm. But then that's why we need to find that study of his. Everything I want to know is there. I'm sure of it. This was the last wing to search, Dad. Bob must have done something to the rooms the day we were in there. Something that hid its true location. <sighs> hmm. Perhaps. Perhaps Todd could be of help to us in our investigation, after all. Weird Uncle Jim? How? We go to him with evidence that the intruder somehow got in through Bob's library. I tell him. I tell him I think it must have been an accident. A mistake. And that we need to get into the room so we can clear Bob's name. Todd has a soft spot for the attendant. It's a weakness, son. One we can use. Brilliant. I don't know about that. But if we get inside, it will take us one step closer to the truth. To the truth behind the Grey Rooms. Bob. Ma'am. It seems as though something is amiss. I'm not sure what you mean. We have worked together for some time now, you and I. Overseen several iterations of the rooms. You have attended dozens of guests. Why is Admiral Beckett any different? I don't believe I'm treating the Admiral any differently. You are, Bob. You are. You were much, much harder on Miss Winters. And for far smaller infractions, much less dangerous circumstances. I... I don't believe that's true. We had an intruder in the Grey Rooms, and you were reluctant to use torture to get answers. Our guest is somehow reconnecting himself with the arcane forces that hold the manor together. And you're worried we're being too harsh on him. If our investors were not so keenly watching our progress, I would put an end to Ash Manor this instant. The subject has performed well. Our returns have been excellent, but nothing is worth jeopardizing the safety and security of the project. Nothing. You are one of the pillars of the Grey Rooms, Bob. I trust you. More than that, I like you. Tell me I have nothing to worry about. Tell me that you have a handle on this. You have nothing to worry about. I have a handle on this. Good. Good. I want you back in top form. Keep the guest in line. No more incidents. Or, well, as I said, I am unable to discard this guest and start fresh. So if steps need to be taken, I will have to take them elsewhere. High standards, Bob. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Very good. You may go. High standards. Indeed.
The phone next to my bed rang at two in the morning. I'd never given anyone the number, but I knew who it was right away. I picked up the handset and put it to my ear without offering a greeting. After a moment, a woman spoke. Still there. Fifteen minutes downstairs. The line went dead. I replaced the Bakelite handset in its cradle and sat up. A neon light buzzed and flickered outside the tiny window above my bed. Off in the distance, a siren sang danger to the sleeping streets. <sighs> Shit. My apartment was above an all-night diner. It was cheap and you get used to the noise. You don't think you will, but you do. Its clientele were pulled from that mixed bag of night owls you find in any city where the population has hit a certain critical mass. None of them ever talked to me. They probably figured that a weird teenage girl living by herself in a neighborhood like this must be some kind of trouble. They were right. She'd probably called from the booth just down the street, then waited in the dark. I didn't recognize the driver, but I slipped into the back seat and the car took off into the night. I knew the woman in the back seat with me very well. Hello, Celia. It's been a while. When I didn't say anything, she turned to stare at the back of the seat in front of her. You look the same. As do you. I wasn't sure you'd want to see me. I'm not sure I do. But you came anyway. The driver glanced in the mirror. Our eyes met. He looked even younger up close. I wondered what he knew. I'm in trouble. What kind of trouble? A, a debt. A debt? <laughs> I know you. You don't get someone out of bed at two in the morning because your rent is overdue. No, I don't. This isn't the kind of trouble where you get annoying calls from debt collectors, is it? This is more the kind of trouble that sees you get shot in the back of the head in an alley behind a bar. Am I right? This got me another glance from the driver. Celia shifted in her seat. You're right. Of course. I, I need your help. The debt I owe? It's not exactly something you just write a check for. We can't go back. <clears throat> Five minutes out. We can't. There's a spot close by. I think you'll be able to draw us in. I found a spot where things get thinner. We can break through. Thinner? We never had a word for this stuff. Who have you been talking to? What did you promise them? There's only one way I can get out of this. I don't want to hear it. Aileen, please. I told them I could get something valuable. Powerful. You... You're talking about the Grail. It's the only thing- You're so fucking stupid. The car slid slowly to a stop. <clears throat> we're here. Are you ready? Celia and I were, so far as I know, the only two people that had ever stepped foot in another dimension. I don't even know if dimension is the right term for the place we found. A really long time ago, when we were just kids, we found our way somewhere else. I don't know if it was because of her or me, or if it had something to do with us together. All I can tell you is that when we needed a way out of the place we found ourselves in, a whole new world was there waiting for us. Eileen, please, I need this. She licked her lips nervously. I hadn't seen her in almost two years. The intervening time had not been kind. She looked tired. 
I smiled sadly at her. This is it, Celia. I mean it. This is the last time. <sighs> Thank you. She nodded and looked so fucking grateful that for just one brief moment I almost forgot everything that had happened. I can bear a grudge for a long, long time. You bring some chalk? As soon as I mentioned it, the driver started fumbling with the glove box. I pointed at him. You know he can't come. I know. He knows too. The driver passed a box back to Celia, who handed it to me. Fancy art supplies. Probably cost a lot. A selection of six colors from the dollar store was all I needed. But I guessed that this was her making an effort. I felt it as soon as we stepped out of the car. We were at the mouth of a narrow alley that ran between what looked like two abandoned warehouses. Celia had said it was thinner here, and maybe she was right. The tips of my fingers tingled, and I could almost smell it. We were going to punch right through, shift from one reality to another like a bullet through a deck of playing cards. We always had more success in places like this. Forgotten places. Places people would hurry past. On the rare occasion they found themselves out this far. Lost places? Could be. I produced a stick of pastel yellow chalk from the box Celia had given me. I started to draw. Just a circle at first. Scratched out at around chest height on the nearest wall. I felt something, but the feeling was impossible to hold on to. My hand twitched like a needle skipping across a record. Tell the driver to kill the lights. She waved at him. And a moment later, we were plunged into darkness. Our only illumination was the stars above. I continued to draw. The yellow circle became the head of a flower. I plucked a stick of chalk that I somehow knew was green from the box and added a stalk. Nothing happened at first. Then the picture shifted. As if the flower were caught in a light breeze. I'd already moved on to the next flower, then the next adding small details and flourishes that just felt right. A few minutes later, I'd drawn a whole forest. It surrounded us. I could hear bird song and the chirp of crickets. And we're back. The ground had turned soft and damp beneath my feet. The trees stretched up into the sky, their tangled branches reaching for the clouds. When we'd first broken through, I'd just turned 14. Celia was a few months older. We thought that the forest was all there was to this place. It took years of exploring before we discovered just how wrong we were. It's this way. Celia gently plucked at my sleeve and she started walking. I fell in behind her. I still don't understand how you can always find the way. I don't have an answer for that. Maybe you can tell me how you can get us here with nothing but a piece of chalk. I shrugged. I didn't have an answer for that either. Just like the first time, I concentrated on the small details, drew until it felt right, and then found myself somewhere else. Who's the kid in the car? My driver? Calls himself Skinner. I got him out of some trouble last year. I waited, but she didn't elaborate. We kept walking, picking our way through the thick, ancient forest, staying close to each other. We'd only been separated out here once before. Once had been more than enough. You could have called, you know. 
It doesn't always have to be me that tries to fix things. I shook my head in amazement. You're talking like I wanted to fix things. You're talking like there's anything left to fix. We had something special. We have something special. I mean, look at this place. A whole world, maybe even a whole universe. And it's just for us. Forever. I don't want this. I don't want forever. I never did. We trudged on, silent but for the dry leaves crunching beneath our feet. A moon that might not have been ours glimmered through the branches overhead. After a while, the trees started to thin. We've never taken anything from here back with us before. You sure it'll work? If it rains while we're here, we come back with wet clothes. We walk through mud, we come back with dirty shoes. You know. You must be in a lot of trouble to consider messing with this place again. We all do what we must. The house at the edge of the woods was still there. We both stopped when we saw it. Of all the questions we might have had about this place, we never discussed how the house had gotten here. I wasn't even sure it was a house. It was like a child's model of a car where the headlights were just painted on and the engine was a lump of plastic painted silver. It was ornamental, like a detailed museum exhibit or an art piece. Or maybe a lure. Lead the way. We had opened the front door when we first discovered the house and never bothered to close it again. It was still open. If it had been closed, I think I would have turned and ran right then and there. Inside, it was dark. The fountain in the foyer bubbled and gurgled, its stagnant water watched over by a faceless angel. Faded paintings stared out at us from gilt-edged picture frames, their subjects now all but a mystery. Dust filled the air and refused to settle, irritating our eyes and noses. Wait. Does it feel different to you? I didn't answer. I didn't want to. I'd felt it, too. The forest could have been eternal, but this place had changed. It was like someone else had walked through just before we arrived and left something of themselves behind, like a scent to mark their passing. Tell me you can't feel that. Let's just get the grail and get out of here. The cup was on the counter, by the sink, in a large, empty kitchen. I'd placed it there about a century ago. The first and last time we'd drunk from it. Just a plain porcelain cup in appearance. As I picked it up and turned it over in my hand, I wondered if it would shatter were I to throw it to the ground. I felt suddenly ashamed and glanced over at Celia. If she could tell what I'd been thinking, she didn't let on. Come on, let's get back. I should have paid attention to what I felt in that moment. There was a flicker of what I'll call awareness, for want of a better word. Like a great eye had blinked open just long enough to catch a glimpse of us. I felt a prickling at the back of my neck. Come on, it's time to leave. I tucked the cup into the inside pocket of my jacket and fought the urge to run like I had just robbed a bank. Back outside, thunder rumbled in the distance, and I tried to tell myself that it was just a coincidence. The downpour came when we were halfway back to our entry in the clearing. The trees shielded us from the worst of it, but we were still soaked to the bone by the time Celia led us to the heart of the forest. Are you ready? She reached into her jacket. 
I had just nodded when I heard a distant crack of dry branch being broken underfoot. Celia didn't seem to notice. Did you hear that? She hesitated before she shook her head, in a way that made me think that maybe she had. She produced the same knife we'd used last time we were here, and held it out to me. Time to make us an exit. Chalk is best when you're working with concrete and brick. For soil and leaf litter, you need to use something wet. I grasped the blade of the knife and squeezed, <sighs> flinching as I felt the cool, sharp steel bite into the palm of my hand. I let go and made a fist and dripped blood into the dirt. There were fields in France that are still fertile today because of blood spilled during the Great War. Sometimes I wondered if the offerings I had made to this place over the many, many years we had come here had a similar effect. Did these bloody paintings I scrawled in the dirt mean anything? Greener leaves, perhaps? An infinitesimal gain in the height of the trees around us? The moonlight faded and darkness fell. The pain in my hand burned a bright red line across my brain. I felt the shift start. I closed my eyes, and for just a moment, Celia was gone. It was easier to leave this time than it normally was. That should have been a warning. Back in the alley, back in our universe. It was raining here, too. Skinner sat in the car and looked in the mirror in confusion as we climbed into the back seat. Back already? I checked the time. It felt like hours, but less than ten minutes had passed since we'd left the car. The details of our little jaunt had started to fade away like they always did. It was as if we had woken from a dream. Nothing was left but fragments and a lingering sense of unease. Do you still have it? I reached up to pat the inside pocket of my jacket. My heart skipped a beat. <sighs> it's still there. I produced the grail and passed it to Celia, nearly fumbling it in the process. She didn't mind my clumsiness. Smiling in triumph, she slapped at Skinner's headrest with her free hand. He jumped, but didn't complain. I don't think he was used to seeing Celia happy. I knew it would work! Skinner started the car and eased out of the alley. He was looking the wrong way, and the headlights of the car at the far end of the street dazzled as they approached its speed. Celia! The other car didn't break. They hit hard enough to spin us around 180 degrees. We came to a rest facing the alley. My ears were ringing, and I think I had a cut on my forehead. Celia shook her head. Eyes screwed shut as she tried to collect herself. Skinner sprang from the car. A gunshot rang out and glass shattered across my face. There was another flash, the pop of a pistol, then the whine of a ricochet. I grabbed Celia with one hand and tried to open the door with the other. It had jammed. Celia, get it the fuck together. We need to get out. The door popped open behind me with an alarming creaking sound. Celia and I tumbled out of the car and onto the road. I tried to crawl. Celia somehow still had the grail and was holding it cradled against her chest. She clawed her way to the front of the car. Skinner! Her driver was lying in the road, clutching at his stomach. Blood had pooled on the pavement around him. Two men in dark clothing advanced out of the shadows to stand over him. They looked calmly around the scene and raised their guns. Evening, ladies. It's funny. As long as I'd been around, I'd never had a gun pointed at me before. I wondered if a gunshot would be enough to kill me. The thought that all that stood between me and possible oblivion was a tiny amount of pressure applied to a trigger sent a chill down my spine. 
Hello, Celia. You, uh... You made me hunt you down. I told you not to do that. You... You didn't need to hurt Skinner. I was just coming to find you. Skinner? That's your friend here? He nodded to his silent companion. The other man pointed his gun away from me. He aimed at Skinner and put two bullets into the young man's chest. No! The driver died without making a sound. I was going to make things right! Hey, what could you possibly do that would make things right? After what you did to me? To my family? How can you fucking fix that? Celia sat up, one arm outstretched as she offered him the grail. I can't bring them back. Nothing can do that. I'm sorry. All I can do is make sure you don't lose anyone. Again. The man frowned. He reached out and took the grail, turning it over as he examined it. What is this? It's the cup that both Aline and I drank from back when we were 18. Yeah. So? (coughs) I turned 18 in 1915, dipstick. We both did. The gunman chuckled. His boss just looked baffled. What are you trying to say? Neither Celia nor I have aged a day in more than 70 years. This is what you bring me? A magic fucking cup? It's true. I don't want to live forever. He pointed an accusing finger at Celia, looking in my direction. This bitch worked for me. She tell you that? She fucked everything up. My son. My daughter. My wife. They all paid the price. His face was a mask of rage as he raised his gun. I don't want to live forever. Wait, wait. You don't have to. Now you have the power to decide who does. <laughs> this is bullshit. I could see a thought occur to him. He looked back and forth between Celia and I as if something suddenly made sense. Celia here told me a story once about a rich little girl and her urchin friend living a painful, terrible life. Both of them tried so hard to escape until one day they did. They just up and stepped through a door in the sky. Huh. So, which one were you? The urchin or the rich girl? The story's a lie. We were lovers, not friends. We were both poor. I still am. But now you live forever. We've never told anyone. Huh. And you never will. The man pitched the grail overhand down the street. It hit the ground, and I got the answer to my earlier musings about whether or not it would shatter. It came apart with a sound like a frozen heart breaking. No, 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 no. The men raised their guns, and I closed my eyes. I was ready. At first, I thought the sound was the roar of a wild animal. It grew louder and louder. The ground shook. And I opened my eyes. The men were looking around in confusion. Celia hauled herself up onto her feet. She reached for me, but I shoved her hands away. The last thing I got to see was the look of hurt confusion on her face before the world, our world, was torn apart. The ground split where the cup had broken. The trunk of a great tree punched through, its branches unfurled, radiating out as the trunk went up and up to spear the clouds.
Another tree spouted just beneath the car. The vehicle shifted and then toppled onto its side. It fell across her legs, pinning her in place. Around us, lights came on in the few apartment buildings that dotted the area. In the distance, there were panicked shouts. Another tree, followed by another and another, punched through the firmament that separated our reality from the darker, wilder places that humans had never managed to tame. I felt a branch snag my leg and carry me aloft. Another tangled around my arm. It was all so fast, and violent, and unstoppable that I barely had time to register being torn in two. There was a moment of blinding pain, which receded like a stone dropped into a black, bottomless well. The drop in blood pressure carried me into unconsciousness and beyond in mere seconds. There's a world that is eternal and endless and unrevealed. Those who discover it will do anything to get back there. Its existence tempts explorers and adventurers, the desperate and the damned, the broken and the brokenhearted. It has no love, no hate, no mercy, no compassion. Even when we're gone, when the dark, endless forest has swallowed our entire world. It's still there. It's still Written there. By Lachlan Watt. With performances by with Tanya performances. Milojevic as Celia, Kelly Nanotowski. With performances as by Amroet as Skinner, and Warren Richardson as the boss. Investigation and Manipulation was written by Michael Zenke. Featuring performances by Eddie Cooper as Beckett. Graham Rowett as Bob, Alastair Mackey as Todd, Michael Turrentine as Samuel, Margaret Ashley as the architect, and Chantal Jean-Pierre as Alma. Musical compositions by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. And audio engineering and sound design was by me, Jason Wilson. Well, another episode down, listeners, as we conclude episode 12. You know, last season, we would have been gearing up for the season finale next week. (laughs) But you're not getting away so quickly this time. We still have many, many more terrors in store for all of you. We really could not do this without all of you, and would like to take the time to thank our patrons once again, and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts, and it makes it easier for more tortured souls to find this show. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Diver Ellie, Ellie Dowell, Emily Cullen, Jackal Bot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jessica Finch, Karina Sonina, Kelly Bear, Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Michael Philic BG, Paige Pye, Patrick Stewart, Plin Plin Plon, All Night Long, Sean Geary, Sean McCorkwadale, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Talicia Gullman, The Original Nick Show, Teresa Tabor, and Natalie Brown. The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and YouTube. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your, your needs. And let's not forget our wonderful Discord channel. Pop on in there to meet all of us. That's listeners just like yourself, patrons, authors, actors, Bob, 
run from the warden, etc., etc. Jump on over to our Discord channel and join in the chaos and the fun that happens there. Once again, thanks ever so much for getting us to episode 12 of season 3. And now, we're getting ready to step into uncharted territory. So, buckle up. It's going to be a great ride. And we're going to get back to work. So, we'll see you next week.